we're going in raw and uncut here. I'm going to walk you through exactly how I would do a first cycle step by step so that you know absolutely everything to lead yourself to the most gain possible in the shortest window possible for your either career or for fun. We'll talk about that in a second. But I mean, this is going to be raw and uncut. There's going to be virtually no cuts outside of my pauses because I don't want you guys to sit here listening to me mouth breathe for too long. Let's get straight into it. Okay, so how are we going to start your first cycle? There's some really important rules of thumb here that I think everyone needs to truly realize before ever really diving in headfirst into starting your first cycle. Maybe this can serve as a blueprint to save you time and your health, of course, like not self-destruct your body before you even get started. But first, we need to talk about kind of your goals as the first step. And I know this is kind of maybe a little bit off topic, but I think it's really fucking important when you're talking about what is going to be my first cycle. You have to decide what you're trying to do for yourself. Are you trying to be a bodybuilder, an influencer, or are you just trying to get jacked. If you're trying to be a bodybuilder, there's a couple things to consider. One, you're going to have to use higher doses. It's a more competitive scene. Therefore, higher doses is equaling a higher risk. It is going to be much more expensive. Bodybuilding as a sport is not cheap. I've covered this before with Jay Cutler's $50,000 diet and many other things that cost a lot of money within pharmacology. It's not cheap. It's also much less likely to play out. It is a highly competitive sport with very genetically gifted people. The likelihood that you'll make an income and a living off of bodybuilding alone is quite small. So it is a risk endeavor. And like I said, it's, it's highly genetically driven. So if you just don't have the genetics, you're kind of in a shitty spot. Now, if you want to become an influencer, this is actually good because you can use less minimal dosing even with minimal risk, which favors the longest term career. Now, why this is beneficial is because an influencer is least expensive in terms of cost of acquisition of drugs and food because you're not having to do huge masking phases all the time. It is the most amount of work because you will have to put in the raw amount of hours to create content, footage, pictures, edit all that stuff, have a team to help you do all these things. But once you get it done and there's a routine and a cadence in place, it's a relatively easy gig, but getting started is probably the hardest part. But I would also argue that this one has the highest yield for an income after you've done all the groundwork, essentially. You're going to make the most money as an influencer compared to a bodybuilder, probably. Unless, again, you're Ronnie Coleman or have insane genetics. And if you're just looking to get jacked, brother, all you need to do is just train right, eat right. You don't need to do drugs. If anything, you just need proper guidance and a good coach. If drugs are involved, it would be like the least, literally the least aggressive approach out of all of these options. You probably wouldn't need anything, to be honest, for even a first cycle. I would just get everything down pat, diet, nutrition, training, all of that stuff, and then worry about the other details. But now there's a big concern here for the first steps. We also have to consider your health because what we're doing is going to be detrimental to your health at some point, whether that's cognitive function, cardiovascular function, or any kind of organ system, liver, kidneys, etc., in your body. So testing for health issues. We have blood work, organ imaging, and genetic testing. All of these are extremely critical before, before you start anything. Blood work is going to be critical because you're going to be checking all of your baseline hormones to know where baseline is. That way, as you move further away from baseline, injecting exogenous hormones, because you're going to be shutting down your natural production of testosterone and various other hormones that follow the pathway of steroidogenesis, it's critical to understand where these hormones are at baseline for you. You also want to see if you're having any pre-existing health issues that are recognizable from blood work, things like elevated lipids, which would become worse theoretically on gear. Hopefully you're a lean body mass state so these things aren't an issue but i've seen it many times with guys who just start is they're already super unhealthy and they've only been on for two to three weeks and lastly it's a really great option to see what drugs would benefit you best maybe you already have a really high serum testosterone and, and you literally don't need a bunch of testosterone to get big maybe your serum light levels of igf1 are extremely low and so for you it actually may be more beneficial to boost that fucking igf1 up so using growth hormone essentially as opposed to testosterone at first to leverage the best benefit. And I know a lot of people are scoffing at that because everyone thinks testosterone has to be your first cycle, but you have a lot of tools in the toolbox and it's not just testosterone or even androgens in that matter. Then what you really want to check on is your ultrasounds or organ imaging. So your echocardiogram, your liver and kidney ultrasounds. The reason for this is because you want to make sure that your current organ systems are not dysfunctional. This isn't something you're going to see in blood work. An echocardiogram is basically going to test the ejection fraction of your heart, how big your heart is, and if it's 
it's symmetrical and if it's pumping correctly. If any of these things are off, using gear is just completely non-advisable. It's probably the worst thing you can do for your lifespan and I wouldn't recommend it. The liver ultrasound is going to see if you have any liver cirrhosis, which most people probably don't, but it's also going to test for any sort of fatty liver disease. These are things you want to tackle well before getting on any form of androgens. And then kidney ultrasound is just testing to see if your kidney is functional and it has no issues filtrating. Otherwise, not having any cirrhosis, which cirrhosis is just a, a fancy way of saying scarring, by the way. And then you have genetic testing. Testing this is absolutely critical because what it is going to do is tell you if you have any genetic predispositions to like cardiovascular disease or cognitive dysfunction. Um, I spelled dysfunction wrong intentionally just because I think it's funny. But anyways, what we have to consider here is like um, a, a great, great, great uh, situation here is when Peter Atia, you guys probably don't remember, but Peter Atia came to Thor, the guy that plays Thor. I actually don't know his name, so excuse me, but he did a genetic test on him and he found that he had a double allele for basically developing Alzheimer's disease or what is the APOE4 gene variation. And uh, that shattered him, right? That was very upsetting to hear because he's the highest risk individual to develop Alzheimer's very early on in life. There's nothing he can do about that. It's just sort of this genetic lay of the land. He, he's kind of screwed. And you very well might be in that same boat or have other predispositions to cardiovascular disease or hyperlipidemia, things that you do not want. And so if you're taking copious amounts of androgens and you have these genetic predispositions, really fucking bad idea, really, really bad idea. You would want to get these tested to see if you're at risk before venturing down the path of having super physiological hormones. Okay, so let's say you've tackled these steps. Everything is all good and tidy. We're ready to move on to the next step. Once you have defined your starting points, okay, which is all of the things I mentioned, your health, and then from that, your specific goals. Once you've defined that, the first step is always going to be testosterone. I'll explain why. First, testosterone is a biologically identical hormone. Not really, but in a sense, right? It's synthetic testosterone, so it's not exactly biologically identical, but we produce testosterone. It's the same carbon molecule. Our body knows how to use it. Therefore, the consequences of taking testosterone are quite low. The ceiling to side effects is also quite high. Unlike other compounds that are derivatives of testosterone, they're not actually within our body naturally. Besides, you could argue neandrolone, but for the most part, none of them are naturally occurring. And so when we put them into our body, their endpoints can cause some pretty radical side effects. We don't want these side effects, but they're going to come anyways. And so testosterone is a really nice gateway because you need it to be physiologically normal and have neural endocrine hormones that actually function your brain and estrogen to actually function the rest of your body, which is primarily where your libido is going to come from, not an elevated testosterone. And if you don't have testosterone in the equation, you don't have those things, which is going to completely destroy your body, your libido, your sex drive, and even your penis size, if you want to get down to the science, right? Uh, which is why you shouldn't be using oral compounds or SARMs or anything prior uh, to doing a first cycle. It should just be testosterone. It is always the safest bet. My rule of thumb is if something doesn't have at least 10 years of human clinical research behind it, you probably shouldn't be taking it. Testosterone has had well over multiple decades, six decades now of research in humans done on it at high and low doses, and it's all very good. Now, there's a couple things you need to know about testosterone. Testosterone has various different different esters. There's cypionate, anenthate, propionate, undecunate, cestodon, and no ester testosterone, which you don't want to fuck with that, especially in the beginning of your, your career. But you have cypionate and anenthate, which are going to be the easiest to manage because their half-lives are roughly a week long, about eight to 10 days. And it is going to be the most consistent for you to continuously inject without being too inconsistent by having a very low half-life or very long half-life. When you have like an eight to 10 day half-life, this means that essentially after eight days, the dose that you've injected has become half. And now you're, let's say, if you injected 250 milligrams on Monday, in eight days, you'll have 125 milligrams of release in serum. Not really, but this is just simple in terms. What we have is propionate, which is a very short half-life, meaning you need to do more frequent injections no matter what. And if you miss a injection, the volatility of your serum levels of hormones is going to be wild. And that's definitely where you'll experience side effects. The more volatility in the amplitude of hormones in your blood serum is what's going to cause havoc in a turbo side effects, right? So if you have a huge dose going on one day and then the next day there's nothing and the next day there's nothing and the next day there's nothing and then the next day then there's something that's going to cause a lot of disruption within normal endocrine function, right? Because you have such an abundance of testosterone one day and then a complete underabundance the next few days. That shift, that peak and then trough that comes down really sharply, that's where you're going to get all those nasty side effects, acne, gyno development, the stuff that is called, you know, mood swings and roid rage. You don't want that. You want to keep serum levels constant as much as possible. So using a moderately long ester is going to be more favorable, but not something like undecunate, which is an extremely long half-life that also is going to cause issues because if there is an improper dosing or you just used a dose that your body simply cannot handle of testosterone, 
you are going to have to deal with that for 10 weeks. And that is a very long time to be exposed to a dose that you either psychologically or physiologically can't handle. And you're going to be put into like literally a situation for 10 weeks that you are going to find God awful, uh, get depressed and have not such a good time. Sustanon, it's a blend of basically four different masters. Just know it was stopped being manufactured a long time ago for a reason. Just don't use it. Okay. Just buy Sipionate and then they, that's all you need. And then no Esther, unless you're a strong man or power lifter, just don't even mess with it. Okay. You don't need to worry about this. Just use Sipionate or Dente. This is what's going to be making you the most amount of gains for the longest amount of time in the safest capacity. Now, uh, injection frequencies and orals versus injectables. So orals, the problem is, is that there's 17 alkylated. They're liver toxic. Okay. So your hepatic system is just going to get ruined by taking orals. The other thing is they go, they're going to cause a lot of non-genomic effects, which basically means immediate effects, but not prolonged sort of like architectural changes, meaning bigger muscles. It's just more of the immediacy of water weight or strength gains or like cognitive function having like an increase. So essentially you can recruit more muscle fibers in the gym. Great effects, but not necessarily if you're looking for actual long-term gains. So you develop really rapid blood pressure issues because of those non-genomic effects. You do develop a very rapid elevation in things like your heart rate. And this, this is not good. This is like, these are how you cause long-term health issues very, very early on in your career. So you want to stay away from them, right? They have inconsistent half-life, so you have to dose them very regularly. And they're really only useful in a short term for like example, gaining strength or changing maybe the texture of your skin if you're one week out from a show. But outside of that, they're really not useful because they're still going to shut down your A access, limiting your hormone production, whereas testosterone is still going to do the same thing. But at least you have the normal physiologically required hormone for you to function as a human being, as opposed to having nothing but a synthetic hormone that's not even what our body is supposed to be running off of. And that will cause an absolute train wreck. Now, injectables, they're non-liver toxic. They can cause liver toxicity or hepatic toxicity at very high doses, but it's quite minimal and almost be honest, very non-notable. It's innocuous for the most part. It's not volatile in its dose exposure. So usually you pin, and if you, let's say, pin on a daily basis, which I'm going to talk about later, the consistency of that serum level concentration is so stable. And so there's very minimal side effects. You do have those long-term changes in your body, which is the sort of muscle architecture that is changing in your body, which is exactly what we want. And even more importantly, um, you have very controllable side effects. If you do get side effects, it's very clear what we need to do because we know the endpoints of testosterone. We know it gets converted into estradiol. We know it gets converted into DHT. We know where testosterone is binding and what receptor sites. So it's very easy to control the side effects. But if you're using another synthetic variation, you know, let's just say an oral compound, the methyl estradiol that it converts into or something else, those endpoints aren't really treatable. And it, again, it can put you into a corner and in a really serious situation where you, you have to find your way out where there's not really a way out. Also, it is genuinely healthier and going to keep you on longer, right? So we have to talk about dose exposure here really quickly as a side tangent, but you want to expose yourself to the least amount of dose for the longest amount of time, because that's what's going to create the biggest adaptation in your body. So something like, you know, a 24 week cycle, totally fine. If the dose isn't too high, that is causing a degree of, of health burden that's just too much. But if the dose is appropriate, where your health is generally okay, exposing yourself to that dose for the longest amount of time is going to equal the area under curve being your gains, right? And that area under curve being super huge, tons of gains. If you just have a high amplitude of a dose, the area under curve is very small. The gains are very minimal. So you want to use a healthier compound that you can stay on longer because the end point is going to be more gains because you'll be able to expose yourself to that compound for a little bit longer. Now, injection strategies really need to be talked about here. Super important. And this is something I wish I had when I was on my first cycle. Basically, what we need to be considering is daily injections with a 1cc insulin syringe. This is the ideal. This will keep your blood serum concentrations absolutely stable, keep the side effects minimized, if any at all, and make sure that you're staying healthy. Three injections is okay. This isn't bad, but it's not ideal. And then twice weekly, you're just being lazy. Once weekly is like you don't even need to be on cycle because you're just kind of an idiot. Not a good idea. I would recommend for almost anyone to do daily injections because it is always going to keep the most stable serum concentration of the drug that you're using, which in this case will be testosterone. Again, if you need to use a syringe, you want to use an insulin syringe. It's a very, very small gauge needle, very easy to inject and will not cause scar tissue development. Unlike a huge harpoon, like a 3cc syringe, which most people start out with pinning 50 uh, IUs or 0.5 cc's of total fluid, uh, using a 25, 24, 23 gauge needle, it's totally unrequired. Just use an insulin syringe. It's going to save you so much tissue that from scarring and uh, 
a hell of a lot of pain and trust me it's a lot easier to pin with an insulin syringe than it is a 3cc harpoon the equipment you will need is a again like 28 28 29 30 gauge i wouldn't really recommend 30 gauge because it's gonna be too hard to pin but you'll want to have like a 29 gauge ish needle 1cc uh, or 100 units insulin syringe you'll need some alcohol pads to sterilize the injection sites that you'll be doing and you'll need a way to dispose of the needles um if you need a cue on how to pin and where to pin intramuscularly just look up nursing manuals where to pin intramuscularly there'll be very clear diagrams on how to do this it doesn't need to be explained by me you can find many nursing videos online right now walking you through exactly what to do then i would also have an antibiotic on hand just in case of an infection my two preferred are going to be doxycycline and vanasomycin these two are pretty damn good at handling like wound-based infections in that sort of subdermis layer so you want to have these on hand in the event that you do have a, a injection that does turn into infection of course you'll want to go to the doctor as soon as possible but sometimes not everyone for example here in canada um, where i'm visiting you, you can't just go to the doctor most of the time you have to be waiting in a sort of tier list that it, it's just it's endless sometimes it can take months to get into get any kind of professional care so having these things on hand is really critical just to make sure you're not going into any severe cases and if you need video walkthroughs and how to do injections just join our discord group we have that kind of thing all day long in there um so we have these things covered now we know we're going to be taking testosterone so how much are we taking let's say we're taking the influencer route i would say about 200 milligrams of testosterone and enthate or cypionate per week would be good to go usually you'll progress for at least six months at a pretty rapid pace without any health effects i mean nothing it's just pretty much pin and forget it right you don't have to even worry about what kind of effects you'll be getting if progress does stall after about six months i would add an additional 100 milligrams of testosterone if progress stalls but you are sensitive to estradiol so for instance you're converting to too much estrogen i would actually add 100 milligrams of masteron or primobolin as these dht compounds are going to reversely inhibit aromatase action therefore limiting the amount of estradiol you have therefore preventing you from getting acne developments gyno clamacia and a lot of other deleterious side effects from having an abundantly high estradiol when you can add 100 milligrams of primo and enthate in, you're going to manage these things without having to add in another drug to consequentially uh, repair or fix the elevated estrogen that you do have now if progress has not stalled your weight has gone up 0.5 percent of your total body weight to 0.25 percent of your total body weight right if you're 200 pounds that's basically one to a half a pound per week um you just need to maintain course as long as you're not getting fat and you're progressing in, in strength and you're gaining that much weight more gear won't do you necessarily any better you just need to keep going at your current rates you don't need to come off this cycle realistically this is something at that point you could stay on for a whole nother year without any issues and after another additional six to eight months you could titrate by another 100 milligrams if you needed to most people out the gate they just start at 500 milligrams and they need to come off within 12 16 weeks because of a massive burden of side effects that's not going to be you the other option is of course if you're going to be a bodybuilder we have to take things a little bit more extreme so you have 350 milligrams of testosterone and then they or cypionate per week optionally to control estradiol you can just start out the gate at in 100 to 200 milligrams of primo anenthate this would be my preferred choice in this scenario after six months if you're not seeing progression which is highly unlikely but it can happen in some people's individual cases this would mean you need to increase the dose by 100 milligrams of testosterone and 100 milligrams of primo bullet usually in a standard cycle that i would make i would do 100 milligram titrations per dose titration and that would take usually about five to six weeks to determine whether a dose titration was needed however because this is your first cycle we do want to be a little bit more aggressive to gain as much as we can while you still are healthy and able to train very effectively and with heavy weights before you age too much you kind of want to start your career as fast as possible to make as much money as possible in bodybuilding before it's too late you get old and no one wants to see your physique anymore alternatively what you can also do to increase the rate of growth if you've stalled at six months is add in growth hormone this would actually be my preferred method because growth hormone is another anabolic pathway that we haven't yet utilized and can leverage you a copious amount of results with pretty much no side effects whatsoever inoculus you can use uh, growth hormone with without really any consequential effects outside of maybe an elevated blood glucose but at this dose and if you're training heavy and hard this won't be a problem for you at all and then again if you're still gaining about 0.25 percent of your total body weight per week and being a little bit more conservative here because we want to stay generally leaner as a bodybuilder you're still on track and you don't need to change anything again 0.25 percent of your total body weight if you were 200 pounds is essentially half a pound a week which is an extremely good rate of gain you can stay on to this dose for honestly up to 12 months maybe longer but now you've probably asked a different question when do i need to stop 
the cycle. Well, here's the thing. None of the standardized cycle bullshit is real. All these 12 week cycle, 16 week cycle, all that is just horseshit. Okay. This is somebody's pontifications for zero reason. I feel like you should come off at 12 weeks. I feel like 16 weeks is the right time. I don't care what you feel. Let's be a little bit more objective and data driven because that's how we're going to make the most amount of progress in a calculatable manner over the longest period of time. So what you need to be doing instead is checking if your health sucks. Okay. So the first thing that's super easy to test is your blood pressure. You can go to a freaking Walgreens or a Walmart, get an arm pressure, a uh, blood pressure cuff around your arm, test your blood pressure, pressure. If it's high or even elevated, those are some concerns. And I wouldn't necessarily freak out if you have one elevated measurement. But let's say you do five or six and they're all consistently elevated and you've accounted for white coat syndrome and all these other things, dehydration, and you're still finding that your high blood pressure or your hypertension is hypertensive. You, you don't want to keep going on gear. Okay. Same thing with a, a high blood glucose rating. If you're getting above 100 mill milligrams per deciliter of your fasted blood glucose in the morning after a good you know cup or two of water some salt all that good shit if you're still high in blood glucose big big red flag that hey you probably need to reduce the doses and come back to a healthy phase also a elevated resting heart rate ideally any athlete of mine i want to have below a 60 beats per minute resting heart rates generally speaking i've seen all sorts of crazy shit with athletes coming in at 90 to 100 beats per minute resting heart rate not okay terrible terrible for architecture like modifications right growing that left ventricle which is not fun at all and also just any high degree of side effects if you're getting estrogenic burdens you're developing gyno you're having a massive amount of acne any of these reasons critical that you stop taking anything or just drop back down to trt the other thing is you've got your labs done initially and you can see where your baseline is at this is why it's so critical to get those done immediately now what you need to do is get your labs done again after those six month time frames that i was mentioning before and see where has my health traveled where is the trends gone after i have stopped taking uh or, or stopped being natural if there's more red than green generally that's a pretty good indication that you need to come off and clean yourself out but specifically what we're looking at is like alt ast and ggt which is all kind of wrapped in sort of your hepatic function if these are not well you are not well get another blood test as a follow-up blood work maybe two to three weeks later if it's still not good you need to come off kidney function not well so you're doing like a ideally you're doing like a urinalysis you're doing like a, a kidney function test in your blood which is pretty easy to do it's basically on any cmp cbc panel if things aren't well there you got to stop kidneys don't regenerate if you fuck your kidneys up it's game over bro and your systemic inflammation is you can test this through see reactive protein and lots of different other markers but if it's not well you're fucked okay you need to make sure that this thing is tightly tightly regulated and you're keeping inflammation status at the lowest possible you can because ultimately you're just going to lead yourself down a very nasty road if you continue to keep inflammation relatively high as you're blasting gear now if you need more interpretation knowledge on how to read your own blood work i recommend going over to uh kurt haven's channel atomic life we did a two video series which are both hour plus long videos on how to to read your own blood work how to interpret it things like that really great source for uh, people who don't know how to read their lab work so that's kind of when you stop your cycle what do you do after you stopped your cycle well first things first okay you're going to drop down to a trt dose of testosterone you're not going up to 250 milligrams it's not trt you're going to go back down to 100 and 125 milligrams of testosterone per week with an entheater cypionate um just a normal trt dose you're going to still want to i would prefer if you again it's ideal if you prefer uh, to do the daily injections, I would continue to do those because it's going to keep you as consistent as possible. I would then wait until your health reaches a baseline. As long as it reaches a baseline, usually about after eight weeks, you can get back on. You've done labs prior to your cycle. So you're going to test now that you're off after about eight weeks and determine, well, hey, is my health a bit better now? Is it back to where it was when I started here? If it's not, if there's still considerable things that are really wrong, I need to continue getting healthier before I consider getting back on anything. Um, if you've done labs and you find that your health isn't off from where you started or that far off, keep going. Blast again. Bring that dose back up to where it was before you had stopped and then continue on with your course. If it is still worse than when you started, wait another eight weeks and retest. After eight weeks, if health is still thrashed, continue to take time off for another eight weeks. This is critical. You want to make sure that your health is not moving in the wrong direction. A lot of people 
will just take eight weeks off, get back on, no testing required. Really bad because the trends of their health are always gonna be negatively depressing across a year, two years, three years, four years. And that is a fucking horrible situation to get involved in. If after eight weeks, your health is sustainably much better, get back on the highest dose from your last titration. So again, if you went six months, you needed to titrate the dose up to, let's just say you're the influencer bro and you titrated your dose up to 250 milligrams, then at that instance, you know, you would go up to 300 milligrams, whatever, that's where you'd start again. Um, and then from there, you decide whether after six months or so, if you need to titrate the dose again. So that is super important. Now, as you're on this TRT dose, there's a couple of things you need to consider. Lifestyle, diet, and training, okay? With your diet, you wanna generally lower carbohydrates because your glycogen stores are gonna be less able to saturate. You, you've sort of diminished your ability to create hyper-saturated glycogen stores, and you're not able to store as much nitrogen or nitrogen recycling has been diminished. So all of these things kind of contribute to how we wanna modify our diet. Generally speaking, you want to lower carbohydrates first because you don't have anywhere to store those carbohydrates as much as you did before. We're gonna increase protein to offset the calorie distribution. I just said that anabolics increase protein recycling. So we're wasting much more protein now that we're not on anabolics. So you're going to need to increase that protein to a small degree, as well as this will balance out your macronutrients to maintain caloric intake, but change the thermogenic rate of the food you're eating, keeping you leaner. Also, we're going to stay extremely consistent with nothing else. I, can, I cannot stress this enough. Don't change shit. Just keep everything consistent. Don't go radically off the deep end because you're off cycle. Still do the things that you've been doing and continue to do them as if you never came off cycle. Training is literally changing nothing. You may have a bit worse recovery. So at most, you maybe want to reduce the training volume to the minimum effective dose of training volume for you. This is why it's so critical to figure out how to train prior to getting on gear, because if you can understand where your minimum and maximum effective ranges of volume are per week, you're in the green zone, man. You know exactly what you need to do during this period of time. Your tissue might not be as robust. And so you need to be critically careful of injuries. Okay. Super important during this period of time. Injuries are very highly prone to happen. Make sure you're lifting cautiously, taking good warm-ups, making sure your body's warm before lifting insane amounts of weight. And then as far as the lifestyle goes, you're going to want to walk eight to 10,000 steps a day per minimum cardio, at least almost every day. Okay. Almost every day. You fat fuck. Okay. We don't want to give fat. None of you are doing cardio out there. It's terrible for your body. Just stop it. Don't want to look old. You don't want to lose your hair. You don't want to be unhealthy. Do damn cardio. Consume tons of water and continue to eat micronutrient rich foods, not chicken and rice. Okay. Let's be fucking honest. Eat micronutrient dense foods. 150 essential nutrients are needed every single day. I've never Ever seen someone actually hit all of those micronutrients. If you're doing this thing right, okay, after you've had the time that you need to get healthy, you then basically start from back up here, except you extend these windows out as much as you need to, to continue making progress. And this, my friends, is how you can make your first cycle probably the best experience that you've ever had and make the most amount of progress as rapidly as possible without any side effects. There is one more caveat here, sourcing. You're probably wondering, well, where do I get the stuff that I need to do what I need to do? You know what I'm talking about. We do have a Discord group and it's linked below. You can join there. We do have private access to some things that people can use to get a leveraged advantage on pharmacology. This is the best place to get trusted stuff, okay? We just leave it at that. If you need to start your first cycle, this is the blueprint I would follow. Don't follow what Reddit says. Don't follow any other forum. Simply follow this. And I promise compared to what everyone else will say, you're going to make it, bro.